in this video, I'm looking at the top 10 urban legends revealed as true in Beyond Belief Fact or Fiction. I feel the show heavily relied on urban legends, even though the factual stories were said to have been researched and investigated by author Robert Traylands. Urban legends by their nature have been passed down and details changed and exaggerated over time. Many have been based on true stories, but that true story has many variations, being retold by different storytellers putting their own spin on it. At number 10 we have the poker game. In this story, a stranger walks into a tavern seeking a card game. He isn't disappointed to find a rough looking group eager to play. He cleans them out and they accuse him of cheating and they kill him. They are a superstitious lot. It's not said that they are pirates or sailors, but their mannerisms suggest it. They believe that the money was cursed unless won fairly, so they seek out a rookie to whom they will give the winnings of the dead man to play with. And being more experienced, it will be easy peasy to beat him and ease their fears about getting the money unfairly. Very odd mindset. Anyway, they find a young man in a church and he accepts their offer, but mysteriously he keeps beating them till he clears them out. They accuse him of cheating, but they somehow know he hasn't. He then proceeds to tell them that his father, who abandoned him years ago, was a very skilled player and he used to watch him play as a kid. It turns out his deadbeat dad was the man they killed. Urban legends about poker games are very common, with people claiming to have had the devil himself as an opponent and have gambled with their very soul. Even now, in a world of technology, there are gambling sites where you can play poker with spirits, many of them with ghostly games up to three times a day, and willing participants happy to part with their money. At number nine is the Curse of Hampton Manor. This seems to be based on Donnellan House, but there's a plethora of haunted house stories to source such material from. So this house is apparently cursed. Bad things happen to everyone who moves in there, primarily ill health and losing all their money. An unscrupulous real estate agent sells the house without revealing its history. When the same thing happens to the latest owner, she makes a killing by relieving him of the property for a knockout price. While she's laughing about it with a friend on the phone, she's taking a bubble bath in the house and is struck by lightning and killed. The real story isn't quite as dramatic, but Donnellan House is said to carry bad luck of ill health and financial woes to all who have lived there. It was reported in the New York Times back in the 80s. In Mayo, where my mother came from, there was a similar house called Lighton's House. Everyone who lived there apparently died. At number eight is the sisters. These two ladies do not like each other and it's clear early into the story why. One of them is quite obnoxious and envious of the other's happy marriage and family. When the sister tragically dies, she requested that she be buried in her wedding dress, but the evil sister has plans. Before the coffin is closed, she somehow takes the dress off without anyone discovering, which has little purpose apart from just being a nasty thing to do. Under the cover of being concerned, she weasels her way in with the husband and eventually manages to convince him to marry her. She turns up to her wedding in the dead sister's dress, but soon becomes very unwell and dies due to an allergic reaction to the embalming fluid. Now, the real urban legend of this is not a wedding dress, but a prom dress that was returned to a department store after being worn by the corpse of a young girl for the viewing, but the family were too poor and couldn't afford to keep it for her to be buried in. It went back on the rack and some other unfortunate girl purchased it. She had the allergic reaction and died. The store, though, tried to deny it, saying that a competitor made it up to damage their business. At number seven is the witch. An adolescent claims to be a witch, and her parents bring her to a psychiatrist who has the reputation of curing teens who have become involved with the occult. A week later, the doctor arrives begging the witch to take away the curse, citing a string of bad things that has happened. She refuses and feels very pleased with the results. Next thing, she's approached to join a coven, which she accepts under the impression it's all very dark and demonic. We see her at the initiation ritual pledging oaths of allegiance to the high priestess. After she has promised to obey, she's told that the coven is all about love and light, not what the girl believed it was going to be at all, and the high priestess is in fact the psychiatrist. The girl now has to only use the craft for good, not evil. This to me could be symbolic for how society sees paganism and witchcraft as very negative with all kinds of disturbing practices, when in fact witchcraft itself is a very peaceful and nature-based spirituality. Its ethos is to harm no one. 
Those who practice dark arts are not part of mainstream witchcraft or Wicca, but the majority of people have serious misconceptions on what it actually is. At number six is the find. A honeymooning couple stop for a picnic and discover a vintage motorbike. He decides to take it for a spin, but as he crosses a bridge, he sees a girl and swerves to avoid her. He crashes, but is only shook up and not hurt. As his wife rushes over, the girl on the bike has vanished. At this spot, a boy having a secret rendezvous with his forbidden lover did in fact accidentally knock her down, killing her and then died himself when coming off his bike at this very spot. A similar thing did happen, except the couple were not unsuspecting and set it up themselves. The urban legend was that the dead guy and his girlfriend had a sort of cold. She would flash the lights of her dad's truck and he would wait at the top of the lane till he saw the signal then drive down on his bike, picking her up and take her off to a private location. The couple investigating parked at that spot flashed their lights on the night of the anniversary and apparently they saw the lights of the ghostly bike coming towards them and then disappearing. It is said to happen frequently to anyone who is brave enough to try. At number five is the painting. A family move into a new home. They find a painting and as it's quite attractive, they hang it up over the fireplace. Later it falls without any reason. After they have retired to bed, they are awoke to smoke and flames. They manage to reach their daughter and all escape. It turns out that the painting survived the fire for the second time and on the reverse of the landscape is a portrait of the previous owner who was not so lucky and lost her child in the last fire that occurred in this house. So maybe you remember back in the 80s, there was a big drama about the crying boy pictures. Several houses that had these paintings burnt down while the pictures stayed intact. There seemed to be a few variations of the boy crying and it was discovered that this was a collection of paintings featuring children from the streets. People were literally terrified and tried to get rid of them. I remember once going into bed and breakfast with my parents and my mother refused to stay there because there was one of these pictures in the house. At number four is the truck stop. A trucker meets up with his trucker friend at a roadside diner. They chat but something just seems off. His mate tells him about a fund. He has put aside money for his family if anything should happen to him. When the other gets up to take a call, his friend is gone when he gets back to the seat. Not long after, the waitress comes over and breaks the news to him that the very same friend had died in a crash some hours earlier. There are a few versions of this floating around highway stops. In America, the most well-known is a truck stop in Pennsylvania. His resident ghost is called Lenny, a dishwasher, who was knocked down on his way home one night. At number three is the drifter, although there's more of a trucker story too. A hitchhiker is picked up by a trucker and they travel some distance together in which the trucker imparts some valuable life advice to the young man. He then suddenly makes a decision to stop the truck and tells the guy to be on his way, leaving him a little confused. He goes into the service station that he has been dropped at but no one is around. He finds the proprietor under a car trapped and attempts to free him but isn't strong enough. Just then the trucker reappears to give him a hand. The guy under the car is fine and is so grateful he takes the young man under his wing. He later discovered that the truck driver in question died some years before, saving kids on a school bus. This particular legend is very well known and it's based on a guy called Pete Trudell in New Hampshire who did die in this way. He has turned up in his big red truck multiple times to help travellers on the road. At number two is the hooded chair. A millionaire collector of antiques acquires this ugly chair and he doesn't care about the curse that anyone who sits on dies. It isn't until his friend and his maid come to grisly ends having sat on it that he starts to panic. He attempts to destroy it but instead he drops dead. This is an actual chair said to have been owned by Napoleon just prior to Waterloo. It's unknown the origin of the curse and whether it preceded his fate on the battlefield. At number one is the blood bank. A New York nurse tends to a John Doe who has been admitted for severe anemia. He is very sinister, but she does her best to try and be a friend to him. He then receives two elderly visitors, also incredibly shady looking. When she goes in to take his obs, one of them is locked in the bathroom, while the patient and other visitor are incredibly abusive to her. After they leave, she goes in during the night to check and when she opens the bathroom door, she is confronted by piles and piles of empty blood transfusion bags. The patient awakes and jumps up, attempting to bite her on the neck, 
but another member of staff runs to her aid and becomes the victim instead. The patient, whom we now understand to be a vampire, jumps out the window and escapes into the night. So this has to be fake, right? Wrong. It's true. It was reported in the Washington Post. Vampirism is a thing and a lot of people actually identify as such, drinking human and animal blood, believing they cannot survive without it. It's quite bizarre and I feel like it would be a mental illness, but medical tests have been carried out on some of them and true enough, they become anemic when starved of blood. So perhaps it is a strange medical condition after all. They don't have supernatural powers though as portrayed in horror movies.